my preferred microphone. So hopefully today we'll be able to have uh, uh, additional quality for audio, even as I wander about this bare pit of uh, space here. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to pick that up okay, and uh, as yesterday, I will be posting uh, the audio, uh, the video throughout the day, the screencast video. Um, now, I like to begin these days with uh, retrospectives, um, because often there's a lot in my boot camps that goes on in a given day, and it's worth taking stock of what happened, sometimes filling in some missing points, um, connecting the dots. Um, and uh, sometimes just uh, emphasizing the most salient of those points um, as it might relate to today's material or, 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 or the broader goals of the boot camp. So yesterday after some administrative, um, I introduced successive aspects of the two rich computational modeling traditions that aspire in their different ways and using somewhat different tools to allow us to better understand the world. And these are traditions which uh, draw us together not merely because they are current, rapidly advancing, and uh, highly responsive to some of the world's uh, larger uh, decision-making challenges, but because, and, and discovery challenges, but because uh, they are increasingly widely applied as well within the health sphere and, and cognate spheres. And there's a great deal of interest in these in different sub-communities within the health sphere as well. And what I articulated yesterday was uh, uh, a sketch, a, a sort of illusion to a, um, what I believe uh, confronts us, which is the possibility of a broad enterprise that fuses these uh, traditions. And what I term, not just data science on its own, not just system science, but systems data science. And while it's tempting to write that off as combinatorial buzzwords and, and just sort of glomming two incompatible things together, um, there's a lot of reasons to believe that uh, these two are highly compatible. And not just compatible, synergistic in what they can achieve. And I sketched a view of system data science that I'll be elaborating on more later today. But it involves a, a significant realignment or a reorientation of system science and components and data science components to leverage the best of, of the other tradition. So it involves system science models that are no longer built and then grow increasingly obsolete. But rather than being products that are provided, um, they turn into more services that are constantly updated with new data so that we can learn from incoming data that have mechanisms that are rich, that are powerful and automated, to update the model's understanding when it comes to parameters, and indeed, um, with respect to model structure, as new evidence arise. And where those models uh, that, that we built might come in, in not just uh, one at a time, but a cluster of models that we end up uh, learning from and sort of an ensemble method, where we don't put our eggs in one basket of one model, but we instead have a, a distribution of possibilities. Now, within the, uh, within the modeling space, we're dealing here with empirically grounded models, models that really take on the task of engaging in a rich way with, with data about the world. Uh, and, and do so in a fashion that doesn't view the model's structure and assumptions as inviolate, but rather uh, where those um, are, are uh, undercut or, or, um, or, or uh, further confirmed 
by the, by the available evidence that comes in, and uh, then adap adapted, to some degree automated and, and uh, to some degree manually. Um, so this is part of a learning, uh, learning ecosystem, which involves rich data, which involves modeling, and modeling not as a crystal ball, but modeling as a learning prosthesis, where it is viewed as a success to discover a incompatibility between the model and incoming evidence, uh, not only at an aggregated level, but along multiple pathways and where that model is, uh, incorporates a better understanding because of that incompatibility that was discovered and the rethinking that goes on. Automated thinking, manual thinking. Um, but where we are updating our mental models and the model. And this requires a wholesale readjustment on the systems, on the, the data science side as well. With data science recognizing that the data that are being analyzed frequently come, I would argue for practical problems often come or almost typically come from underlying tangled complex processes where one source of data and another source of data, perhaps collected at a somewhat different time, somewhat different area of the system, are different faces or facets of that same underlying system. They're different, they're different sides of the same underlying system and where each of them can provide insight. Each of those data sources, taken on its own terms, can often provide us insight into what's going on in other areas of the system through Taken's embedding theorem, as we'll be seeing, and through, um, through uh, combinations with models and tools like particle filtering and particle MCMC. So uh, we have this opportunity of broadening our understanding of data source to illuminate a broader system that's giving rise to it and recognizing that multiple data sources speak not just to the information in them, but to the dynamics of this overall system. I also noted that this will require a reorientation of much of data science uh, insight that relate to dynamics towards reasoning about counterfactuals. Now, this is actually a, a quite profound reor a reorientation that's needed because in traditional data science, we are analyzing by definition data about the world. And that data contains rich patterns that we exploit within our data science tools. So whether it's deep learning and artificial neural networks, connectionist approaches, whether it's support vector machines um, uh, and uh, tools such as random, random forest or decision tree models, or whether it's tools more familiar to many in the room, such as logistic regression and generalized linear methods, more generally, um, these are tools that operate on data that has been collected from a system. And there's nothing wrong with that data. That data can be insightful. But we have to recognize that it came from a certain data generating process. And that data generating processes over time come and go, they evolve. And when we are operating, with an underlying system that is not being perturbed, not being disturbed, not being um, altered in, in great ways by an intervention or external factors, that data may illuminate salient relationships and associations. But when it comes to interventions, when it comes to putting into place new policies, or when it comes to putting into place new interventions on certain areas of the system or when it comes to putting into place wholesale changes due to due to uh, changed external circumstance that that alter the dynamics of that system the associations will often change significantly and sometimes profoundly and we can't count on variable a and b necessarily being associated in the same way 
a year from now that they have been for certain classes of systems, particularly where we're undertaking interventions in them because our interventions are by, by design seeking to bend the curve, seeking to, to change things. And data is, is uh, uh, something which is derived from and beholden to a certain data, data generating process. And in as much as we're seeking to, to plumb, to understand the associations in the data, we do so with a obligation to recognize when those, when those inferences will be valid for the current context and when we need to be cautious. Much of system science is designed to look forward at, at alternative um, counterfactuals, to, uh, to evaluate counterfactuals. Much of data science has traditionally been somewhat backwards looking in the sense of looking at data that has been collected. And what we're talking in systems data science is taking data science and focusing it um, in a more fulsome way on this issue of counterfactuals. And I would argue that this makes data science more valuable in some regards. Because when we're dealing with a change situation, a situation where an intervention has been in place, or a situation where there is a new policy regime, or a situation in which external conditions have, have, cat, have catalyzed a big change, say, in the context of a, of a pronounced recession, or um, a wholesale change to um, the refugee status with respect to people entering the country. I would argue that um, in this case, we need to learn faster and more richly about the situation as an imperative. And data science can help with that. Data science can help with meshing dynamic models with incoming data for this new situation that's in a way that can illuminate more quickly, reground us in this new reality that's been shifted. But to do so, it needs to leverage the tools of, of, of system science as well. Each of these traditions I view as needing the other to reach its full potential, to reach the, the, the full abilities uh, of, of what can be attained. And data science and system science both require a reorientation to take advantage of those opportunities. And that's the province of systems data science. So you may have wondered um, why I was talking about this issue of data sources illuminating the broad areas of the system. And today we're going to see um, a good example of that in the form of particle filtering. Today we're going to be introducing particle filtering and you'll hear at least one or two um, of the case studies today. Others will be coming in coming days. Um, and what are the hallmarks of these case studies they argued yesterday? was that they show how data, um, which, is, uh, which encounters the model through particle filtering, um, even though that data may relate to one area of the system, it sheds light on the broader dynamics of the system, including, critically, many areas of the system which are not evidenced directly. This is, again, an area of emphasis for system science, where I think data science um, needs to, to move along to really fully exploit it more in system data science it's central. This issue that models have latent state. So when we're dealing with uh, the broader world around us, most of aspects of the dynamics, most aspects of the processes that surround us and that end up affecting us are not directly evidenced in our data sets, as rich as they are. There's a lot of factors in the world about us that are either in principle not observable are too burdensome to observe, are infeasible financially and logistically to observe. And therefore, we make do with those pieces of the system which we can measure. Even data that matches those four Vs I mentioned yesterday, the high volume, the high velocity, the high variety, and the high veracity, even those data sources often relate to particular components of the system. 
maybe it's a sentinel population that carries you know ethic on their smartphones maybe it's um, some subset of the population that's tweeting and whose geolocation can be identified or some subset of the population that's using Google search to to carry out their health seeking we're, we're capturing certain points of the system uh, within our data, however rich they are. And yet, so much of the system out there is underobserved or unobserved. Observed in a way that uh, perhaps isn't recorded. And yet, we want to reason about those parts of the system. And I argued yesterday that there's two broad ways to do that. One, we're going to see more is particle filtering and particle MCMC tools like that, filtering tools, which have a model that explicitly depicts a posited structure for the broader system. Not a privileged representation, but one that's a working hypothesis. And where the data coming in, by virtue of the model logic on the one hand, and what we do know at certain pieces, other areas of the system can be inferred. So Shao Yen's models, uh, for example, uh, measles and pertussis, uh, for example, or Lugia's on, on chickenpox. Um, you, you're only gathering data here about diagnosed cases, but it ends up illuminating how many people are probably susceptible, how many people have recovered within the system. You only observe a fraction of cases, perhaps, for adult pertussis. The reporting rate may be quite low, but we start to infer how many other cases might there be out there, but how many other previous cases were there who are now at higher levels of immunity because they, were, they, were, um, they occurred earlier, and, and now they, they must be engaging in a slow waning of the immunity, um, immunity process. We don't observe them directly. We don't have data about them. But the logic of the model is such that if that's a good depiction of the world, and it's a depiction of the world we're always seeking to evolve, then it, what we do see from the data plus that depiction of the world tells us a lot about other areas of the system. That's one way in which we learn about the broader system through observed data. We learn about these latent areas of the system. Much as turning on a light over in this corner of the room in the middle of the night might illuminate things over there. Much as people streaming in the door here, even though I can't see what's going on in the library, I'll think, okay, there, there must be a fair number of people in the library and they're probably crowded over, a lot of them are crowded over to this side to explain that pattern, even though I don't see it directly part of the logic of the 3D space and the, and the movement that's going on. Maybe I hear a hubbub, um, you know, going on and I, I, I infer something about, about in the, from the room, the noise in the room, I infer something about the noise in the library. Um, that's one way. The other way, though, is profound. And we're going to get to it on Friday, but it struck me that since I keep on giving mention to it, I should show it to you. So you'll um, pardon me if I take a moment to show you something which um, you are welcome to share. I had sent mail to many of you prior to the boot camp suggesting you download a software package called AnyLogic. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you've done so, you're welcome to follow along. I will be showing you some aspects of one of the models which I posted for your perusal. And uh, you are welcome to, to see it yourself. So I called up this morning. I called up AnyLogic. Um, and I will go through a similar process here, um, which will uh, allow you to follow if you'd like to do so. So I'm going to go to the site here. This is the participant resources for the boot camp. And I'm going to go to example models, OK? Uh, these are the resources provided to you. I've been updating the provisional schedule as well as the many videos. Spent some while last night editing videos to, to split them up appropriately. Here's example models. I'm going to go into example models. Now, um, there's uh, two models of note there right now. Um, and I've reason to believe that Wade is working on a third, even as we speak. Um, 
one recognizes the lion, ladies and gentlemen, by his claw. Um, but uh, I'm going to highlight here this second model. It's called Hares, Links, Predator, Play, Delay, Embedding. Okay, um, and I'm going to um, to go see uh, what this involves. And if we go in there, we'll see a couple of things. But one of them is an ALP file. Now. Um, AnyLogic has some issues as a platform. Um, one of them is it's no longer super easy to, do, to download a model in isolation. So I'm going to download the whole thing. I right clicked on this and I, I chose download. And it's going to zip it up and it's going to download it to my computer where I will then unzip it, open it, and um, I, will, I will show it to you. Okay? So here it is. It's, it's downloaded. To my computer and I'm going to go open it as you might do the same. So um, I'm going to go uh, here into File Explorer and here's the file in my downloads that I downloaded. I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to extract to here. Depending on, it's, it's unlikely that everyone in the room will be running Linux, uh, although I'd love to talk with you if you are. Um, uh, but uh, in your own operating system, you can probably do all the tasks that I just did, including um, uh, including unzipping a file, probably in a way that's even more convenient than in Linux, um, which is recommended by many virtues, but, but not necessarily by ease of use. Um, so I just downloaded and unzipped that, and there's a folder that was created that contains all the sundry things in that in that uh, folder up on, on the web. So this is just a little bit of kind of um, uh, you know, show and tell for, for how, to, how to use any logic here to download things. Um, this is the file I want to open in any logic, this one here. So uh, this here file, as they'd say in southern US. Um, so I am going to uh, go open any logic. Um, and uh, it'll be different on your particular system, but um, uh, here I'm going to uh, call it up. And we are going to open that file that I just downloaded, okay? Uh, once any logic uh, comes up, uh, I'm going to open this file and I'm going to then run this model by running a simulation of the model. But first, I'm going to describe to you what this model represents. And as any logic comes up here, I will um, uh, I will go open it, and I will go open my downloads. There it is. There it is. Um, and uh, I am going to open it. Boom. Um, and it says yes, it's already open. It knows it's master. Okay. Um, there we are. So here's this model. TAs, please deploy your, your, your uh, I, so, so if, is there anyone who needs TA help to get this onto their computer and open it up? If you'd like to follow along, please raise your hand and a TA, I can assure you, will rush to your side. Okay? Okay, um, so, so help over here, needed? Okay. Okay, who else needs help? Okay? Who else needs help? Anyone feeling beyond help? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I won't ask you if you think I need help. Um, okay. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we just downloaded. While you're um, while you're um, getting set up, I'll just describe something about this model. This model is just one. I frankly, while I was eating breakfast this morning, I said, "Okay, I got to get them all together for this." Um, so I, I, I went and I, I put a model in place for this um, exercise, but um, it's not particularly privileged, okay? I could have done this with any number of models, but it will illustrate a point, I think, in a way that I can emphasize. This is a model that depicts predators and prey and their dynamics over time. Um, for those familiar with uh, mathematical modeling, it's, it's related to what's called the lat couple terra equations, okay? And it's a classic model of predator-prey, and it was inspired, I might add, by a Canadian exemplar. 
and particularly uh, in the Hudson Bay Company, it was noted that the price of pelts for snowshoe hares, of the fur of snowshoe hares, was, um, was uh, alternating from year to year. It was going through cycles. And people tried to understand why this is going through cycles. And one of the, one of the things they found was that snowshoe hares were a lot more a lot more numerous in some years. And it wasn't just they were numerous in the past and then they became increasingly rare. Um, it, it was some years they'd be high and some years they'd be low and so on. And looking into this more, um, uh, there was, it was discovered that snowshoe hare populations varied in these oscillatory waves, these waves that, that went up and down over time. And upon further study, it was, it was uh, found that this was accompanied by uh, changes. And so I just right-clicked on simulation, because I want to show this to you. Um, I right-clicked on simulation. I said, run for this uh, simulation that was opened. And um, it's going to give me a, a message. Uh, I just ignore it. Ah. And it's going to present me a screen like this. And I'd like to show this so you can actually see the dynamics. I'm going to say run the model here, OK? And here is a little simulation. It's a mathematical model of hairs and lengths, which is an attempt to represent this historical context um, in a more stylized fashion. So we have hairs um, running in northern Manitoba and, uh, uh, and in northern Saskatchewan. And we have lynx, a prime predator of hares. Um, and uh, we have an interaction between them. Lynx, ladies and gentlemen, eat hares. But I can assure you the reverse is not true. OK? Um, and hares, uh, in turn, can be killed by lynx, but can multiply at prodigious rates with hare, hare births. Lynx multiply at much slower rates, but can die. In particular, they can die uh, on account of starvation uh, from uh, unavailability of hairs. Okay? And um, when this uh, system was studied, uh, mathematically, it was studied in a, in a stylized fashion, um, which captured these stylized facts. Uh, bursts for hairs are largely independent of lengths. But deaths for hares are highly dependent on, on lengths. Deaths for lengths and, in this case, uh, deaths for lengths are tied up with availability of hares. But lengths natality in this version of the model was represented as largely independent of, of hares. This is a variant of the model. And what you see induced by this is a series of oscillations. So hair population, shown in uh, gray, uh, or lynx population, shown in red, oscillate over time. OK? Yes, Levy. So there's a latency between the populations again? Yes. Like, I mean, once yes. you see lynx high, like hair is Correct. high, and then Correct. it's high next. So, so if hairs is high, you'll notice that that's at a different time than lynx is high. You might think the two are directly associated, right? If there's lots of links, if there's lots of hairs, there's going to be lots of links. If there's few hairs, there's going to be few links. And you could be, you could be excused for thinking that. It's a, it's a reasonable first cut uh, static understanding of this situation. But in fact, what you find is that it's not quite that way. When hairs are very high, it does tell us something about lengths, but where it tends to be is the point when the lynx population is growing the fastest, when it's expanding the fastest. And suddenly, when hares are low, you might think that, well, if there's few hares around, there's going to be few lynx around. But it's not quite that way either, because when hares are low, there's often, it's because there are a lot of lynx eating them. And therefore, the lynx population is still reasonably high. But what is true is when lynx, when hair population is low, lynx population is coming down quickly because lynx are starving to death. 
And we could go into the mathematics of this, but I, I, I won't do that right now. But what you see is that links being high leads conversely to a rapid decrease in hairs. If you have very high levels of links around, hairs tend to decrease quite quickly. Hmm? Now, this is an example of when I say the systems we're dealing with are coupled. Often I'll use the word tangled to refer to even larger systems. What I'm talking about here is if we study links, we can, it's hard to study links here on a fulsome way without studying hairs by implication. Certainly scientifically, to understand the population of hairs over time, the, the, the researchers involved needed to understand links population because the two are coupled, they're tangled. But not only that, ladies and gentlemen, but to intervene on the system effectively, we need to, we need to take into account the, um, the other components. For example, here there's a button, inject 50 links. This is the number of links by times 100. You'll notice uh, this is, this, these are on the same scale here, but this is links times 100, meaning there's a lot fewer links than there are hairs. I'm going to inject some links here, okay? And you'll notice that it perturbs the links population. It, so we, we release the links, okay? And what happens, ladies and gentlemen? Can you see? What, what, what happens? How does that change the system here? Does the, it, the is that impact on the, of increasing the lynx population, does that change the hair population at all? Yes, it, it, it moves the hair population. The hair population ends up taking a steeper dive. Why is that, do you think? If we have a lot more lynx running around, what do you think happens to the hairs? Yeah, a lot more hairs get caught. And so it goes down. But eventually the hair population starts going up. And do you notice something odd about the size of the peak hair population now? We introduced links, ladies and gentlemen. We introduced the predators of hair. So you might think, you could be excused for thinking, okay, there's a lot more links around, there's gonna be fewer hairs from now on. Because there's, there's more mouths trying to bite them. If I, <laughs> I guess that's not how they describe it in vet men, but, um, <laughs> but uh, there's more mouths going after them. But do you see something curious about the hair population after compared to before? Are there always more hairs later? Or, or sorry, always fewer hairs now that the, there's more lengths around? I'm trying to... No, it goes higher. No, it actually ends up going a lot higher than it did before. So we introduced lengths, but somehow... It's impacted the hair population, not merely by decreasing it, but by leading to more, to, to actually higher peak hair populations. How about in terms of the minimum of the hair population? Does that change too? It's lower, it's lower than it was before. So we're causing more, more dramatic oscillations, more market oscillations in the hair population as a result. These are coupled systems. And intervening at one place, like lynxes, lead to changes that ripple around the system and affect other things like hair, and affect them in ways that are not obvious, not immediately obvious. Like if you sat back and you asked me, what's gonna be the result of this, or you showed it, you know, to a professor who teaches differential equations. Um, they're not going to immediately, uh, you know, to, to be able to just intuit what goes on. We, we build a model and we study it and sometimes we see counterintuitive results. There's also delays here. The reason we see these oscillations is that, you know, there's delays in responding. When there's few hairs, it means the lynx population crashes. And because the lynx population can crash, what goes on with the hair population? It starts to recover, because there's not many links around. A lot of them died off. So that gives the chance the hairs to multiply, because hairs, ladies and gentlemen, can multiply faster than links. And so the hair population grows, but guess what happens as a result of the hair population growing? 
the lynx population follows suit. Yes, Levy. Well, this is a very interesting question. Is there a causal relationship from one to the other? You bet there's a causal relationship. How correlated are they? Not necessarily highly correlated, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, they, you know, as I argued before, the highest peak of the hair population does not occur at the time of the highest peak of the of the lynx population, nor does the trough directly coincide. So there's a delay here. And you could say, well, are they lagged correlated highly? And you know, that's an, an interesting question, but the point is that that these patterns reflect the underlying the underlying delays associated with the system. And could you ferret interesting patterns out by lagging things and examining potentially. But you can also find things where A influences B and they are, as we said yesterday, uncorrelated over a broad period of time because sometimes they're positively correlated, sometimes negatively correlated. But my goal in showing this was not just to show you a coupled tangled system where intervening in one place of the system ripples through to affect other places and where the patterns coming out of it um, have deep causal uh, linkages, but where those causal linkages yield to unexpected results and where they aren't necessarily immediately correlated in an incredible obvious way. But my goal in showing this to you was something else. And it relates to this point I was making just a few minutes ago that Observing one part of a system, like collecting data, similar to Hudson Bay, on the hair population, ends up illuminating the broader areas of the system. There's a logic to the system, and if uh, Sao Yan were to model the system, or if, if uh, Chen Yang, as, as she models, uh, the mosquito population with admirable uh, facility and virtuosity. If she were to take a look at this, um, she could do a particle filter model where, you know, if we have a hair population observed over time, something about the hair population, we could probably infer what's going on with lynxes. And that's one way to do it. It requires having a model that posits what's going on. But there's another way too. I would argue that in systems like this, which are frankly most systems we struggle with, we grapple with in health and healthcare, whether at an individual level of clinical management or at the level of, of population uh, health or health services, these coupled systems, if we observe at one place, like hair, hair or the price for hair pelts, it turns out that that ob set of observations, a time series of information on hair pelts collected in Wade's hometown of the Paw in, um, in, in Manitoba, um, which uh, was probably a, a notable trading place for pelts um, in, in earlier times, um, that the price of hair pelts tells you by itself, independent of a model, about something what gave rise to it. Now, to see this, I'd like you to take your mouse, click on here, and drag. And what you will see here on the left-hand side is a plot of hairs versus lengths. And you will say, what the heck? Maybe I understand this, you know, that these are successive days over time. But what in the world is this set of concentric circles? And to ease your, start, start picking apart your confusion here. I'm going to stop this, and I'm going to run it again, but I'm going to scroll down to that place, okay? And we're going to run it out, and I'm going to speed it up, okay? And you'll see what's going on. It's going around in a circle. You can actually just see little bits of evidence of it as, as it goes around. And on the x-axis, 
is the hair population. On the y-axis, ladies and gentlemen, is the lynx population. This is called varyingly a state space plot or a phase space plot. Okay? So at a given time, the system here, so the top, we have two variables, right? Hairs and links over time. Here, at a given point in time, here time is implicit, at a given point in time, we have a certain number of hairs, let's say 5,000, and a certain number of links, let's say just over, um, uh, just about 115. At another point in time, perhaps a little bit later, we'll have 5,250 hairs and somewhat over 115 links. And as the system evolves, we'll plot out on the x-coordinate the number of hairs, on the y-coordinate the number of links. And this is what we get. The shape, ladies and gentlemen, of a circle, or an ellipse, sort of squashed circle, right? What is that telling us? Well, it's telling us the system's in a kind of repeating state. It's in a periodic orbit, as we say in, in dynamical systems. So it starts in one place and it progresses around. Let me, let me plot out the beginning of it again so you can see it played out in, in, all, its, um, in all its beautiful detail. Here we go. Um, and you can see it kind of going around. It's, it's etching out. It's going around in a sort of clock, uh, anti-clockwise way, counterclockwise way. You can see it filling in as it progresses. And each of these points, like when it puts a new point there, that corresponds to some points up at the top graph for that point in time. But it, here it's progressing it out at lengths versus hair. And we can see that it's in a sort of periodic situation. If we were to take you know, the first 20 or so time units there, and we were to repeat it again and again of that top graph, we could give a pretty good approximation to what that graph shows, right? It's, we, we have several complete cycles of it. And that's what this suggests down below. We're, we're just returning to the same point again in terms of the state of the system. How many links and how many hairs? The state of the system is repeating. It's like Groundhog Day. Remember that movie? Oh, man, here we go again. You know, the, they keep on trying to disturb it, right? Um, they go off a cliff in a truck, I think, with the groundhog, uh, up to a tiny fill, um, I think. And um, this is Groundhog Day, ladies and gentlemen. But let's perturb the system. We're not going to go off the cliff in a truck with Puxuatani Phil, but we're going to perturb it. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to inject lengths here. We saw how that would yield changes in time. How do you think it's going to affect things here? So if I add links, what's going to happen here? If, if I add links in, what's going to happen? So imagine I'm at the point 5,000 hairs and 135 links. What's going to happen if I add links? Where am I going to go? Don't, don't tell me. Don't, don't tell me where you want me to go. Oh. <laughs> where, where, are you, where, is, where is it going to go as a result? You're adding links, you're not immediately changing hair, so what's going to happen? It's going to go up, right? It's going to go up, much like your minds throughout this boot camp, hopefully. Um, it's going to go up, and then what's going to happen? Well, it'll start to evolve, right? And you'll see a further evolution system. So let's, let's not just try to figure it out, because we as humans tend to not be very good at that in our wetware. Here we go. Look at that. Looky that. Um, so now it's going around. And, and where is the system now? Well, it's in an orbit. It's in a, it's in a repeating state, but further out. And now you start to, start to perhaps appreciate it's more extreme. Remember we said this for hairs now? It's more extreme too. It goes to lower numbers of hairs on the extreme and higher numbers of adding links leads to higher numbers of hairs. It's hard for us to get our statically oriented minds around that, but it's true. <coughs> There's higher numbers of hairs that can be induced by having more of their predators introduced at a place. 
and now we're in a separate orbit of the system. Do you see that? Okay, so we perturb the system and it affects the state. You'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, it's occupying, so in theory, this is another important point. So in theory, this is our state space. And in theory, we could be at any point in the state space. It could be two hairs and two lynxes, Noah's Ark, right? Um, or we could, we could have 100, uh, 100 lengths and one hair, <laughs> one very scared hair. Right? Um, we could have a hundred hairs and one lynx that's salivating. Right? Um, but in fact, the system only occupies a thin manifold in its space. Its actual exploration of the state space is very limited. It sort of goes through this orbit that it's not in the logic of things. It's not in the nature of things for to suddenly start wandering off here. The logic of the system is such it stays within a thin manifold, a thin shell of its possible behaviors. And of course, by perturbing it, we could cause it to, to try to go to different places. But we'd be limited because if we added lengths, if that's our hammer, there's only so many things we can accomplish. Um, and, and it shapes the system in, uh, in ways that are, are dictated by its logic. But I mentioned earlier, if we want to illuminate what's going on in the system, and we could gather information only on hairs and, and the pelt price of hairs in the paw, and we know something about links through a particle filter model. And we'll see that. But I want to show you something Ladies and gentlemen, that should be food for thought. So you notice I've been somewhat artfully trying to keep this on my right side of my screen. Now I'm going to go and reveal to you something else. So these plots here. Do you see any relationship between these plots? Do you see any? Did, do these plots look wildly different, or do they look somewhat similar? The angle is different. It's kind of squashed in weird ways. They're kind of distorted, stretched. But locally, they're quite similar. And, and every point here can be mapped to a point here. Now, for those who are mathematically inclined, Jason has his hat on, I have his hat off to him because he's a dual major uh, math and computer science. And he may know over in uh, the mathematical corridors, this is it's called, this exhibits a diffeomorphism to this. It just stretched it. Uh, it just stretched it in kind of a local way. And um, putting aside uh, differential geometry, this is really the same structure as this. It's just distorted. It's like those mirrors in funny houses which you know, they stretch. Or I hear there's these apps now that people look at themselves and, you know, it, it makes, me, makes me look thin or something. Um, okay. Um, so this is the stretch version of this. Um, and you might say, well, so what? I could, I could have funny mirrors and mirror houses by going to an amusement park. But what I want you to pause to think about is that this graph here is shown hairs versus lengths. To produce this graph, we need to go measure hairs and we need to measure lengths, go through a lot of work to measure those two places in the system to plot this out, right? To characterize the state space. These two plots to the right, the first of them is generated only by information about hairs. Come again. This plot here, I only use the hair population information to create this plot. I'm only observing the hair population, such as through the price of pelts and the pot. This right graph here, I'm only observing the lynx population. I have no information about hairs, and I create that right plot. 
they are plotting the same thing as this plot that has both hairs and lengths, which required information on both hairs and lengths. And what I am submitting to you now, what I am arguing is something that was discovered and proven mathematically about broad classes of these coupled systems, those very systems we grapple with and struggle with in terms of effective decision making, in terms of blowing back at us, in terms of squeezing here and popping out there. For those systems, measuring one aspect of system behavior can give you information. It contains information about the broad system. I measure hairs. And I know about the state space of the system and information about its structure. I measure links. And I know about the state space of the system and aspects of its structure. Now that may strike you as, as curious. But it makes sense. Remember we, we set up that previously here with the hair population. If I were to tell you. If I were to tell Wade, you know, uh, Wade, um, I'm not going to tell you what the lynx population is, but the hair population is really high right now. Wade could, with good reason, say, well, probably the lynx are very happy. They're going to, he's not going to tell me how many lynx there are, but he'll tell me that probably there's, if, if, unless there's a ton of lynx, they're going to be happy and fat and probably multiplying rapidly. By contrast, if, if I were to tell Wade, there's lynxes in every street corner of the province, and you know, you know, thousands and thousands per square kilometer, Wade, Wade would probably, with good reason, be able to say, well, I don't know what the hair population is. But whatever it is, it's probably decreasing quickly because there's tons of links around to eat whatever hair they see, right? So in short, knowing, modeling aside, knowing about something about links tells you something about hairs, that it's decreasing quickly. Knowing about hairs tells you something about links, that if there's tons of hairs, links population may be growing quickly. And so information about the dynamics of the other, like the rate of change of the other, is encoded. And you know, a variable will tell you about information about the other, it'll tell you about information about how the other is changing. And what this is saying is that here, information in one observable over time, if we consider it over time, it's telling us about the other, the complete state of the system, and vice versa. This example is an arbitrary example. I could have done this with a system with 15 state variables and found its and reconstructed its state space using just one variable. Why? Because it's coupled. They're so they're joined at the hip, hairs and lengths. They're so joined that understanding one is going to tell you, it's going to whisper to you about the other. It's not the full situation. But, but uh, a lot of information about this. And here we can prove that we can reconstruct the system. And this is a general feature. What differs is how many dimensions we need to do this. Sometimes we need three dimensions um, in order to reconstruct it. Here what I've done is I've plotted hairs now versus hairs as they were some amount of time ago, say a day ago. And it reconstructs this. And often we'll create several dimensions. So we'll have hairs versus hairs at time t minus 1 and hairs at time t minus 2. This is called the delay embedding. Okay? We're taking each point in time, hairs of the time series, and from that point in time, we're constructing a vector. Something that has an x and a y coordinate. x is the current number of hairs, y is the number of hairs one day ago. And we're plotting it out. For each point in time, we're plotting out hairs as it is now and hairs as it was a day ago. We're plotting that out, and that gives us something that is provably 
provably the same information, provably diffeomorphic to provably just a stretched version of the full state space of the system. Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to highlight here is this does not depend on a model. I don't need a model to do this. I could do this without any sort of model of the system. It does depend on salience, uh, you know, uh, virtuosity in, in particle filtering, nor, you know, wage skill in, move, in building that particle filter model of a hospital. It doesn't require, a, you know, a doctorate and anything. All it requires is one time series of observation and plotting it out in a systematic way in, a, in, in this sort of delayed embedded fashion. And you can know about the broader dynamics of the system. You may then aspire to build a model of that system, but this doesn't require any sort of model. This is purely an empirical phenomenon that is rooted in provable mathematics. So when I say that data sources from the world, time series, whisper to us of the broader system that gave rise to them, that, that affected them. This is, what, one of, this is what I'm talking about. The data source by itself contains information about the whole part of the system that's driving it. It is packed with information about the broader system. Information about hairs over time tells me about the broader system, including dynamics of that Lynx population, even if you don't have a model of it. You never observed it. It's, it's full of information about what is driving it. And this is of great assistance in building simulation models of these things, but it's not, it's not bold into that. It's not limited to that. And when it comes to data science, this is what I mean by data science can fruitfully broaden its recognition to say that when we have a data source, say over time, a high velocity data source, actually after all that's what we have here, it's a high velocity data source, something that's measured you know, on a daily basis, we can use that to give insight into the broader system that gave rise to it. It's not just a measurement at one place in the system. It whispers to us and sometimes yells to us about the, the broader system that underlies it. And by reasoning about that underlying system, as it's whispered or yelled to us by different observables, we can often come to a much more profound knowledge of what's, what's going on in the world than just if we treat this as an isolated data source. Okay. So yesterday, I gave this brief plug for why we need to broaden system science and data science to achieve the full potential of each jointly, and why we can leverage the insights of one to inform the other. We then went on to discuss aspects of dynamic modeling, this notion of uh, building models that, um, uh, that attempt to depict the causal structure in the world, not because those models are privileged or guaranteed to be right, be, but because we use those models to more quickly realize when we're off base and advance our thinking and advance our model. The models are a tool of humility to determine when our thinking is off base, more quickly alert us to that so we can advance our thinking. And those models, once built, and once we have a degree of confidence about them, while they'll always be challenged, they can be used to try to reason about the world, how things might progress, what might be going on right now, and what the trade-off between different interventions are, to help us assess data items which are particularly valuable, or which, um, which need to be measured at certain rates to be useful, etc. We talked about hallmarks of health big data, and I emphasized four Vs. Volume, yes, but velocity. And you see why velocity is supposed to be so important here. Velocity allows us reconstruction. Velocity also allows us 
to richly ground our dynamic models. Variety was another key point, and I, I argued that variety point was related to these um, to the fact that in our dynamic models we depict multiple pathways of influence, and the variety of big data in in big data can ground our model across multiple pathways in a rich way. And finally, uh, we talk about greater veracity for, say, physical measures about where someone's located or who they're with compared to relying on self-report, in part because self-report is subject to recall bias, in part, you know, so you're asked once a year to ask what, how often did you eat fresh fruits and vegetables for the past year? That's a really hard thing to generalize. If you're asking people to take photos of every meal um, or to scan a barcode uh, associated with those meals or what have you, or to have point of sale information on what they're buying at the store, you get a much, much less uh, recall bias affected uh, uh, set of data. Um, but it's also a reflection that sometimes it's just so burdensome to report things. We had a measurement back in 2009, we did um, a study called uh, FluNet, which involved uh, using um, sensors to record people's proximity patterns within a community uh, here on campus um, during the flu pandemic. And we had detailed patterns every three or so minutes about people's proximity. Yuan Tian was one of the people who helped run the study. Another was a colleague, uh, a now colleague, then student, Mohammed Hashemian. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, one of the things we found, we asked people to diarize who they spent the greatest amount of time with that day, and for periods of time, I think it was that day, um, and we recorded it via sensors. And we wanted to find if there was a, you know, the high correlation between them, if, if one could substitute for the other, like self-report for, for recording. And what we found is there was huge differences between who people said they spent time with and those they actually were recorded with. There were a lot of missed contacts, like people who were nearby in line in Tim Hortons, but they didn't notice or forgot about, et cetera. Brief ephemeral contacts, and then contacts which you know just slipped their mind. But the biggest thing was they <laughs> revolted. You know, um, they they refused to record after you know some number of weeks. They said, "I'm not going to do this. This is so burdensome." I, I'm not going to spend my time enumerating from my memory who I spent time with today. It's just too much work, too much hassle. And that's, um, that's an important lesson too. That limits, that enhances the, the relative veracity of, of measurements because it's, it's not so burdensome. It, we're subject to less censoring due to participant um, non-adherence. Um, Okay, so uh, we talked about the encounters of models with big data, how we can use big data, high velocity, high variety, et cetera, together with our models. And we talked about several ways, including filtering approaches that we talked about today, parameterization databases, calibration to judge the model against, compare its output with, with what we observe, its, its emergent behavior. Um, and we talked about using it to judge models understanding what intervention effects would be versus what we observe for the world, taking advantage of the fact that we can then use a model to ask, okay, if this intervention fell short in this pathway or that pathway or that pathway, how can we design a more effective intervention in the future? We springboard ourselves to reasoning about the future. We then talked about two data sources, Twitter and search data that provide varying levels of uh, velocity, uh, variety, and veracity. And we ended with a case study. One thing I didn't mention yesterday, but should be emphasized, and I wanted to have a slide on this today, but I, I didn't have time to pull this together, is, ladies and gentlemen, I argued yesterday that the, about um, uh, that our focus here is particularly on machine learning components of data science and big data. Um, there's many areas of artificial intelligence more generally that are not in our purview here. We're not talking about robotics, we're not talking about speech synthesis, we're not talking about uh, speech recognition, etc. But even within machine learning, 
there's many uses of machine learning which are not dynamic in character. We're not seeking to, to understand a dynamic problem. Let me give you a few examples. Suppose we're seeking to understand tweets like you had did yesterday. Right? She had these tweets. She was seeking to classify the, those tweets. That's not a dynamic problem by itself. It's a set, it's, she used a machine learning method that could then inform a time series understanding about how many classified tweets classified as being influenza cases were there over time. But the, the problem she used of text classification is not itself a dynamic problem. And it doesn't therefore fall within the purview of system science. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, if we're classifying images as to whether this contains food or not, or whether it's an image of a um, person that is sick, um, there's, there's going to be many aspects of that that um, might be of interest within our modeling, but it's not by itself a dynamic problem. So there's many non-dynamic problems that are studied within machine learning. This is, this is most. Um, and uh, we will often pursue those with machine learning tools without seeking to directly leverage to answer them with dynamic modeling tools. When it comes to dynamic problems, problems that involve change over time, um, these sort of problems, um, we start to, to wonder about, okay, how do we, uh, is it fruitful to combine system science approaches and, and um, machine learning approaches for these? And there's going to be some of them where we may choose to do so. So these might be ML and system science approaches. We'll see a bunch of those today. And then there's going to be some dynamic problems where we end up just using machine learning methods. Um, and those where we combine these will articulate a set of different ways we can combine them. But particularly for complex problems, these fall into this category. So, we're not, we're not saying here that system science is a tool that will always be fruitful for using with ML problems or replace ML problems for all classes of ML problems. Far from the case. Just like AI has many spheres that aren't the purview of system science, so it is machine learning has many spheres which are non-dynamic problems. And if you look at many publications in machine learning, you'll find that they concentrate on non-dynamic problems. You know, better able to even classify, does someone uh, who has certain characteristics from their electronic medical record or, or certain, um, uh, or certain characteristics in terms of their personal situation, are they depressed, right? I mean, that's, as it's phrased, that's not a dynamic problem. Um, and machine learning tools are great for this in the health sciences. Really, the purview of this boot camp and of ML and system science is a class of dynamic problems um, where uh, we're seeking to understand behavior over time of the system. Perhaps discover when did that person get depressed, for example. Uh, when did they become depressed or how are they likely to evolve in the future in terms of the dynamics of their depression or what would help them most effectively escape that depression. Um, in terms of intervention measures. This is what's going to be the focus of this boot camp, um, this class of dynamic problems. Um, but it bears noting they're not all ML problems. There's many ML problems. In fact, most ML problems out there, machine learning problems in health, are not couched in dynamic ways. There's a subclass of these which could possibly be converted to dynamic problems much as many static analyses in epidemiology, someone might argue, is, are, are better couched in a, in a dynamic way. And uh, I may allude to some of those, but fundamentally, we are concentrating here on dynamic problems within data science, which can leverage um, machine learning and, and system science to yield great insight. And there's a broad class of those as well. But it bears noting there's many other types of machine learning and data science problems outside of the sphere of what we're covering here. Okay? So um, 
Uh, just be aware, it's not like we're saying since system science and machine learning can be combined so effectively that that should be used everywhere machine learning is used. By no means is that the case. No, no means is it the case that system science needs to be combined for all elements of AI. Far from the case. It's really a subset where system science is needed to, to behave most effectively. Okay, so let's take a break right now. And we will continue on with some material uh, related to a, uh, the, the articulation of data system science and then quickly go on to material for um, smartphone-based data collection as a third major source of value, smartphone and wearable. It's yeah. been bothering me for the last 30 minutes. Yeah. How do you count the links and the hairs? <coughs> How do you count them? <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, the it, it um, could probably be done something like the number of, so it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to count the entire population. Yeah. Just as, you know, when we're dealing with reports of an illness, we're only only capturing a subset of those uh, actual cases that are reported, right? Yeah, but for the report, and so it's human, like, oh, I go to a doctor and doctor reports. Well, yes, exactly. So at the time they were doing this work historically, I believe they were using the number of pelts that trappers got. So trappers would seek to trap links, or, or they'd seek to trap hairs in these, in these traps. Um, and. Uh, and they would look at the number of hairs that were trapped, probably per trap, right? How many, if for each trap that you have deployed, how many hairs are you getting, you know, per trap? And they probably use that to estimate, as an estimator, a population estimator, of the number of hairs out there. But um, they, I don't know that they were measuring links directly. It's an interesting question. Um, I think they were operating off of data from uh, from from pelts for hairs. But I can go check that. The point is, you don't need to measure both to get inside of both. Yeah, yeah. Because I was thinking that maybe they like. Like a catchwa and write a number. <laughs> well, there is. That's that's capture, recapture, <laughs> and And there are people who do that. I know. Yeah, um, birds, <laughs> um, you know, animals. Wade's brother um, captured sturgeon, <coughs> and they would tag them and release them to fit. Oh no! And and absolutely, that's a technique in some areas. But for, I think when they were operating collecting yeah. hair data, they were operating off of pelts from traps. Okay. Yeah, and there's limit, it, it's actually quite a bit similar to Chen Yang's work with um, mosquitoes, because she has mosquito trap data. And, you know, the mosquito population, um, you know, is, is vastly larger than what we trap. What we use the traps to estimate the mosquito population. Right? At the same time, there's many confounders, like presence, like if it's heavily raining or if it's really windy, we'll capture a lot fewer of the of the mosquitoes, and, and we have to reason about that for for Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Uh, Carol, I'm just gonna stop this. Uh, uh,